ways to do transfer learning on this. And we've just started. Like we've been working on the hip dysplasia thing for years, and there's just, just begins. There's this possibility of many other problems. So, so that's we're kind of at the beginning of a new. I can see the, the future here where we can analyze um, all kinds of clinical problems of body parts with ultrasound uh, and AI. There are a lot of issues to do with the data, and um, I wanted to touch on that stuff because this might not be, if you're not working in the medical applications, you might not be as aware of these. So um, AI training is learning to match expert labels, uh, images, and diagnosis. It needs huge data sets, so thousands of patients. Um, even if you're doing weekly supervised training where you don't actually need a label on every patient uh, or every scan, there's still, you know, you're going to need lots of data. And this is a secondary use of the data. So in general, patients um, didn't consent to this originally, right? Like the data was collected because, you know, uh, Uncle Bob came in with abdominal pain, so he got an ultrasound. He didn't, he didn't think this was going to be used five years later in a research study or in a commercial endeavor. Um, so the data is valuable to train artificial intelligence, lots of ethical and legal issues. Now, Canada as a country is very well positioned to lead in artificial intelligence in medicine. And that's because we have a national healthcare system. Every province has a single payer database. So everything that happens in the province medically, every patient has a single nine digit identifying number in Alberta. And all of the things that happen there go through billing through the central agency. So we collect everything. We know, you know, there's one site which knows everything about that patient. This full population data gives us a, a way to look at unbiased patterns of disease, accurate patterns of disease. If you're, for example, in my American fellowship in Boston, MGH is part of the Harvard network and they have about, they have multiple clinics around the city and multiple hospitals affiliated, but they're serving generally pretty wealthy people, right? They're serving wealthy white people. It's kind of like, it's very much not, it's a very biased crowd. So if you were using just the MGH uh, data collection system, then, um, you know, you're missing huge portions of the population. Whereas here in Alberta, we, got, we have everybody on the same system. So that's very important. Um, and uh, the value of the data for machine learning is, incre is increasing over time. And um, it's something that uh, we in Canada, we're kind of like the Scandinavian countries. We have this opportunity where our data is, you know, something that can be used to really help make advances in medicine that may not be possible in other places. So we should be kind of proud of that. That was not anticipated when uh, Medicare was designed. Um, however, data is, there are issues of data privacy. Medical images are sensitive. Um, the format, the file format is called DICOM, and that's kind of like a, it's like a garbage bag format, like, I don't know, like the PDF format. The PDF file format that Adobe uses is kind of a garbage bag. You can put into it JPEGs and PNGs and whatever kind of, it can collect a variety of things. DICOM is like that too. You can put into it, you know, um, ultrasound, CT, x-ray images, uh, you know, just strings, data like this. And the file header is this clumsy thing that over time has evolved to contain all sorts of stuff you might not want to see in there. Like, for example, your pregnancy status, your body mass index, your phone number, your birth date, your height, you know, all these things, right? So that's just built into the identifiers. Many, and some of these fields are proprietary. So like if you're with Philips or Siemens, you might have, you use the standard headers because you're required to, and then you might have some other headers that you just decided you liked because you could just put them in. And those might contain anonymous, and this, this might contain incriminating data as well, like sort of private information. So it's very difficult to clean the data from a DICOM. The trace is remained. And even if they didn't, medical images are uniquely sensitive. I mean, what could be more sensitive than pictures taken inside your body? Um, and they're intimately linked to diagnosis and prognosis. The data from these is very precious. Uh, here's some examples of why it matters. An athlete who his x-ray shows knee osteoarthritis, maybe instead of getting a multi-million dollar contract with the Oilers, he gets removed. They just say, sorry man, your, your knee is gonna be bad for the next few years, you're out. A pregnant woman, you know, a woman who is noted by some, some test that she is pregnant might be terminated by her employer. It's of course illegal, but they wouldn't discuss it. They just give another reason, but oh, we don't want pregnant ladies, right? Men with coronary artery calcifications might be denied insurance. So, you know, this data is extremely important, sensitive, confidential stuff, and it's the obligation of the data custodian to protect this. And the data is even more private than you, even more sensitive than you think. Uh, for example, 
many of you have probably had a dental scan. You know, maybe you've had x-rays at the dentist, maybe some of you've had a code beam CT scan at the dentist. Well, if you reconstruct that in 3D, like this is something I did on our workstation, uh, it took about you know, 10 seconds to produce this, there's the face, right? So it's, it's in there, or an MRI. Here's a picture of the, MRI, of the brain which might be done to look for a stroke, but you just reconstruct it with a different window showing the skin, and there's the guy. And he gave me specific permission to use that. But uh, you know, this is, uh, the data's in there, more is in there than you think. And so sharing data has some risks to the individual, but it can also benefit society. If everybody shares their data, then artificial intelligence can be trained to improve medical care. And so this is a, there are lots of ethical issues. Uh, patients have many concerns with that, um, which uh, I won't go into detail there. But I will tell this little story, which is about giving consent. So, you know, when nowadays when you go in for a medical study, you might think, well, am I consenting to this? Am I agreeing to have this done? Well, and what is the what is real consent? So here's a, here's a study in 2017. The job search website, modeled on LinkedIn, was just created, put online. And a bunch of people signed up for the job search website, thought, oh, this is great, I'll sign up like LinkedIn. 98% um, of them agreed to the terms of service. You know, so you click join, it asks for some information, and then it, and then it gives a, tech, a check mark, you know, I agree to the terms of service. So they provided explicit consent. They've written explicit consent for this, to, to be part of this and to have the terms of service. However, look what the terms of service said. It was 8,000 words long, which is just like LinkedIn, and it two, it's clause 2.3.1, pilot payment types, child assignment clause. In addition to any monetary payment the user may make, uh, all users agree to immediately assign their firstborn child to aim, drop, and incorporate. And if they do not have children, this agreement will be enforceable until 2050. So your current and future children until the year 2050 belong to name drop. 98% of people agree so, so they look after all those children. So, I mean, this was just a, this someone just invented this on the web, so there was no ethics process that went through this. Oh, oh for the um, research oh, studies. Yeah. Well, they just because it, they made it clear that this would, um, you know, this was all fictitious, and they emailed them later and said, you know, this, there will be no further. Yeah. Progress with this. Yeah. So this That's right. It would have been buried, right? Like, you know. But they modeled it. They modeled it on LinkedIn. They did it the same as LinkedIn was there, right? So that was the concept. So that just highlights that consent is not just ticking the box, right? Like, what is real consent? There's, we think the best is explicit consent, where somebody discusses with you the risks, benefits, and alternatives to this. What is the risk of giving your information? What are the benefits? Um, and what could you do instead? What other kinds of consent exist? Presumed consent, broad consent, um, which is where you agree to a certain type of use without knowing exactly the details of it, but kind of in general, this type of use would be okay. Or there's opt-out consent, where I definitely don't want this to be done with it. And then there's this waiver of consent or implicit consent, where giving consent is impractical, so like all these millions of, of scans that we've already collected, we can't go and ask everybody again for permission. But somebody thinks that it's of enough benefit to society that we can proceed without risk of the patient. So people's perspectives worldwide are different on this. In Europe, the GDPR is very restricted. Even if it's fully anonymized data, it has no links at all, then it's personal data. The patients can opt out from specific uses of it. Um, in the US, they're a bit more uh, Lenient, they allow it if it's individually identifiable. Um, I won't get too far into that, but uh, in Canada, we think that explicit consent is not required for research that relies exclusively on secondary use of non identifiable information. So that's like the stuff that we are proposing to do with AI. So, but it is important that we think carefully about what's done with the data. So that's data privacy. Also, we have to think about liability. So, just like thinking of self driving cars, like, we have to think of the levels of AI autonomy. How much can AI help you? And how, mu and how much can it help now? How much can it help soon? And what levels are there? So the level zero would be no artificial intelligence, it's just a human. Number one, the AI is helping the physician. Number two, maybe the AI does most of the reading, but the human is supervising it. Number three, the AI does all the reading, except the human can intervene. And then you go further up to number five, where the AI completely replaces the human. 
obviously, number five is the completely self-driving vehicle in all circumstances. Um, AI can be helpful or harmful, and I think the analogy here is to the Boeing 737 MAX crashes. So earlier this year, you'll recall the two airplanes crashed because there was a problem with the stall protection software. Um, that's kind of along the lines of a level two or three AI. So the human, you know, the stall protection thing steps in, the human can override it, right? But it was a catastrophic failure, a whole bunch of people died. So who is liable? Well, the pilots, did they perform the protocols correctly? Did the airline, was the airline liable? Um, was, was Boeing, the manufacturer, liable? A lot of people might think Boeing's mainly at fault here. Um, or is it actually the regulator because they didn't evaluate it properly? So who is liable? It's important stuff, and in medicine, obviously, medical liability is pretty important too. Uh, is the clinician liable for using the AI tool properly? Is the radiologist liable for uh, you know deciding to use the AI? Did the department or the hospital or the health region are they primarily liable because they said, well, let's use this tool? And is the manufacturer liable? So this has not been tested in Canadian courts properly yet, so we don't know where the subtleties of who's going to be responsible because this stuff will make mistakes. And uh, the question is, how do we deal with that? So another thing that I do in my role um, as a you know, clinician, academic, and uh, computer science person is uh, to work on these issues. So I'm, uh, I wrote this, I'm the first author on this one. It's a white paper on ethical and legal issues related to artificial intelligence in radiology, representing the Canadian Association of Radiologists Artificial Intelligence Working Group. And so we're working hard on those issues to try and figure out, um, you know, strategies to deal with those problems. And I think I, I wanted to show you those so you can understand issues with data privacy and liability that are incurred when we're doing AI research and AI development in this. So, almost done. Come to my vision. You've heard elements of this. Um, basically, I think I would like to see in the future art uh, portable ultrasound at points of care scanned by people who are minimally trained, so you don't have to be 10 years of training to do this, you may have been trained for a weekend, um, and then you perform a scan, it's interpreted by artificial intelligence, which is the primary backbone of interpretation, uh, supervised by humans, but increasingly over time becoming more autonomous, and um, it provides answers as to what you should do, what the patient has, and what is recommended to manage it. And this um, extends the reach of ultrasound, and in fact, all the data that's collected over the years by doing this gets fed back in and helps the system further improve. Yeah? I'm just guessing that it's part of your vision that you're going to want to have a really fast connection if you have a remote expert and a rural, for example, trainee. So you can tell them in real time, a little bit to the left, a little bit to the you know, right, a little up, a little down, now move on to the next section. And so I think you're probably looking yeah, like, I mean, in a sort of an earlier iteration, when it's back at sort of level two or three, when it's the human supervising it pretty directly, then you need to have these, like, good internet connection and an expert standing by at the hospital looking. As you get later, um, I'd like to see it more. It's more, it's much more feasible if you don't really need that internet connection. You've got a trained network built into the, uh, into the device, and it reads it, gives its opinion, and if it's a critical case, maybe you then contact the hospital, but in most cases, it's given you so the need for that high-speed cloud kind of gets less over time. Yeah, but the problem is that the technicians have difficulty with the instruments. So you need some supervision from someone with more expertise to say, okay, you know, you're, you're kind of missing the target. You know, so that's why I'm saying that even as you propose, which is onboard AI, it doesn't really solve that. Well, one of the ways the onboard AI will work is as a quality control. It will. You know, we envision, and another tool we've been testing for the hip or in early stages is where it actually is watching the images as they're produced, and then it, it, it basically beeps or sends a check mark once you've acquired adequate images. So it's kind of doing that role on board. So that's, we're not there yet. It's not fast enough, you know, inside. We need to optimize our networks. But I'd like the, the AI to do the quality control uh, to determine whether an adequate picture for interpretation has been so that, I think, is a good answer for that. that. That's the way we'd like to, you know, an answer to that problem in the future. So we'd like to extend the reach of ultrasound. It's going to look a bit like the tricorder, actually. You have a handheld device that you can scan the patient uh, 
and you know it analyzes, gives you an answer as to what it thinks is going on, and uh, you know, it's what Mr. Spock was using in the 60s. And so, why should we do this in Edmonton? Well, artificial intelligence, artificial intelligence expertise, um, you know, is, is second to none here. I think the Amy Group at the University of Alberta. I think you know we're we're a really strong center of excellence for that here in uh, Canada, and we have that full population net care training data. Um, that we've discussed, so like uh, we have data from the entire province, and we also specifically in Edmonton, this is the frontier, this is the gateway to the north. So when I'm on call for pediatric radiology, I'm on call to the North Pole. Like if somebody is is sick uh, in Tuktoyaktuk or Inupiaq, they get flown to Edmonton. They get you know if a child is ill up north, then they call like our hospital. So we are the gateway to the north. We manage patients from all the way in the far north of Canada. So where is there the clinical need for this type of a solution? It's right here. So Edmonton is the place for this. We have an excellent healthcare system in the city and people in the far north who are not receiving the care that they should be getting. And uh, that's a really strong reason to be motivated to do it here specifically. So what am I thinking for um, uh, the integration between uh, uh, computer science, engineering, uh, medicine, um, Alberta Health Services, industry? Well, I think in Alberta should be doing a different kind of pipeline. So it's a technology translation pipeline. Um, and it's a partnership between all of these stakeholders. Clinicians are identifying the medical problems to be solved with ultrasound. Training data is collected in partnership with AHS. Um, and computer scientists and engineers, such as yourselves, are testing the feasibility of AI solutions. Some of the, the ones that are most feasible to be commercialized get spun off as startups and technology and uh, other ones go into more of a research and academic fields and get uh, um, spun around. And as we do, as we work on this pipeline, the, the, what's going through the pipeline instead of uh, oil is um, we're developing innovative training and jobs for students, for learners all throughout. We're diversifying the Alberta economy. We're growing up the U of A, Amy, Edmonton, and Alberta, and we're improving healthcare for everyone. And uh, I think, uh, that this is a vision that I'd like to work on with you guys together. And my, uh, uh, I'm applying, I'm one of the candidates for the uh, CIFAR uh, AI chair, which is something that this the, the computer science uh, department has available. And um, I think that I'm well positioned to, because of straddling the clinical academic and, um, uh, <coughs> clinical, academic and computer science kind of fields, um, I think I have an opportunity to help increase the possibilities of what we can achieve together. So I'd like to make this different and better kind of pipeline something that we in, in Edmonton and Alberta can be proud of. I think in Finland, what they have, they don't call the pipeline, they call it the platform for physiology. So it's being distributed, like in one instance, to 50 million users in the county of one particular you know, variable. So I think you have guys to come, so I think it's platform, not place like all of the time. Sure. Well, in Alberta, it's a pipeline. that I've uh, convinced you today that uh, um, the vision of, uh, of portable ultrasound uh, is something that we should be, an AI interpretation of this is something that we can work on together. I thank you very much and I take any questions. sounds fancy, but really it's just a stack of 2D images. Yeah. So I think we just need stacks of 2D images. So as long as but then that then introduces a little bit more user variability and being able to capture them yeah. properly. It does, but the artifacts that you generate um, can be evaluated, like between the two, between slices can be evaluated to guess at the slice spacing. And then if we know, if we have a model of what the shape of that structure should look like, then we can fit. So like a lot of the time in, in a lot of the diagnoses, you know, if you have gallstones, it doesn't matter if they're 1.6 or 1.9 millimeters, it's just that you have it. So, so I think that can be worked with. Like, when we're developing it, we'll use frank 3D scans, but um, when you apply it out in the field, I think you can approximate it with a good 2D suite. So, yeah, good question. Yeah? Could you elaborate more on the uh, transfer
pretty big jump. So it's, I mean, we haven't, we basically haven't really started that yet. That's just an idea. But basically, it's a hypoechoic, it's a dark, dark self-contained rounded structure, right? And the tumor in the liver is also often their dark self-contained rounded structures in an area of intermediacy. So, so the imaging characteristics of it are not necessarily that different. So we'd like to try it out. We haven't really tried it yet, but it's a thought. You know, but definitely one possibility. So my, I mean, my perspective is primarily academic. Like I'm very proud of our startup that's commercialized, but, it, but my vision is that we'll, you know, we will spin parts of it off commercially. But like I'm envisioning a sort of a, a development platform or pipeline that can go partly commercial and partly uh, academic. But it's mainly software. Like the concept is that we're hardware agnostic. So like, you know, we can analyze any ultrasound image. It can be gen as long as it's a reasonable quality ultrasound image. So Siemens, GE, Philips, Clarius, like anybody can provide the images. Um, and you could upload it to the web uh, into a server, or you could integrate it with your PAX system, or you could build it into a certain hardware. So maybe Philips would like to negotiate with, you know, uh, Meadow to, to, to integrate it into the hardware and build it in. Or maybe they don't, right? But like, you know, that's a, that's one approach. I, I don't want to be a hardware manufacturer. Like, I, I don't know how to build an ultrasound, and I don't want to get into that. But I think there's a real role for interpreting pictures, and it should be a role that applies to as many different kinds of ultrasound images as possible. Yeah. So, uh, so there is the shame from you know, sensing in the imaging chain, processing of that, so registration, and then, of course, interpretation. Why is that shame? So I think the um, like image registration, like when I showed that picture of the flashlight, multiple parts of the flashlight, you know, looking at different parts of the body, um, if you could know exactly where in the body you're looking, then that would help with interpretation. The trouble with that is it requires a setup with sensors that either very very accurate sensors <laughs> that know exactly where you are, or a room full of detectors which show exactly where the machine is. So there's more hardware required for something like that. So I. I think there's a lot of opportunity to improve that in the tertiary setting, but for point of care, I think it's mostly built on image interpretation. Like, but I think there's opportunity in both. There's a lot of place, a lot of ways we can extend the reach of all these. Hope that answers. You're still, your so problem is still. Uh, yeah, I was curious because I guess apart from what enables a smartphone to integrate the number of images, say, in a panorama. We certainly we're working on it, and some of the other some of my colleagues in the department are working quite hard on that. And now that's a great segue into other other talks that you'll have. Um, the trouble is the accuracy level has to be so much better. Like it's if your GPS here can be good too. Well, not your GPS, but your accelerometer and your your sensors for the uh, using your Wi-Fi, Bluetooth, and so on. Those can be accurate to half a meter, ten centimeters, kind of like that. But you need a millimeter accuracy or sub millimeter accuracy for the to do it to really know where you are. In the so that's really challenging technically, so people have been working on that, right? Um, lots of people working on that, and I think there's hardware advances that can come with that, and I think those can be really complementary to the AI analysis. And with the hardware that knows exactly where you are, and with registration algorithms which allow you to know where you are, you can go even further. But I think that the key thing for general population adoption is going to be, um, rather than making one special expensive piece of hardware, it's going to end up being interpreting from what we've got. But, but we need both. I think it's interesting to try, like, it's important to try both. Yeah, related to the question about, now, um, can these images be
stitched together. Like, I think it's quite, so like, like a panorama photo or something like that. Yeah. Yeah. So just call it the tree. So in principle you can, and, and then painting the body is very appealing as an idea. Right? I guess the issue I have with that is that it takes quite a bit of time, and if you actually try scanning the abdomen, for example, it's full of bowel gas and bowels that are squeezing and moving, people are breathing, you know, it take, it, you could construct something but it would be a rough stitch because the patient is not sitting still. <laughs> Everything inside the patient is moving, and so it's especially things like the heart, which is beating, right? So there's many complexities to that, and um, I think that's not my sort of primary field, but I think that, that uh, registering the images is a crucial advance, for sure. And I think it will help us a lot to understand things in the setting of a hospital, you know? But it's gonna be, it's harder to, uh, unless you had a super accurate hardware that can go out in the field, it will be less directly relevant to what, to what my interest is. So it's the, um, on CT, for example, you have a unique, uh, it's Hounsfeld units, so it's a certain threshold. Everything that's brighter than a certain amount is bone, basically, or everything that's brighter than a certain amount or darker than a certain amount is a certain structure. But ultrasound is very, the grayscale levels depend on how you turn the knobs, so um, it's less consistent. And also, because of those views not being consistently registered, so you're not sure that this is actually a view taken from exactly this position at this part of the body. Um, so you have to recognize based on relative anatomy rather than absolute anatomy in general. So those, are, those two challenges right there is enough to take lots of big corporations away from it. You know, if you're Google, you think, well, I forget it. Ultrasound, they pay less for it, and uh, CT and MR are much more interesting. So, so there's an opportunity just in general. Like, you know, we, I would personally not be too keen to get too deep into ultrasound analysis, or into AI analysis of, of x-rays, because as you can see, it's already been done by so there's, I think there's more opportunity in something that seems a bit harder, but that we've been developing expertise in. And that's, that's, that's why I'm excited about ultrasound, uh, in addition to the, the obvious fact of it being portable and having a whole different range of applications. So thanks very much, everyone.